Hey, Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Glad you're here. Coming up, we're going to talk to Professor Vincent Racaniello from Columbia University, Ivy League professor in virology. Uh, he's our resident expert in all this, so we'll talk with him coming up in just a little bit. In the meantime, uh, before, uh, or just in case, you've begun to think that anyone's really made any sense of this whole virus in any way whatsoever. These are two headlines, both from Bloomberg, published on Thursday, last Thursday, two and a half hours apart from each other. Okay, same, same news outlet, two and a half hours separate. The first one I saw, new, uh, first one is, children don't pass COVID-19 to adults. They don't do it, they don't pass it. Two and a half hours later, same new, new bloomer. New reports on virus in kids fuels uncertainty on school, <laughs> saying it does spread amongst kids. And obviously, we're going to talk to the professor, his thoughts on all this. But, like, what do you do with that? What, you, you can, it's choose your own adventure. You can come up with any conclusion you want based off of any headline. It's amazing and super frustrating. What are we supposed to do with that? The best we can. This is, this is the best I have. Uh, I mean, we're not going to go over it for the thousandth time, but I think it's time the government let some people do what they want to do within reason. The goal was never to stop the virus. The goal was to keep the number of cases under a certain level, under the healthcare capacity line. We're there. We've done that. So let someone go get a haircut for the love of Pete if they want to go get a haircut. Okay, wear masks keep distance with most other people. I think if we decrease our touches by 80%, right? Like I'm a hugger, I like to hug or shake hands or whatever, like just we don't do that anymore. Like that's a huge cut down. And if every once in a while you go out to a place, <laughs> right? Like overall your number of touches with other humans cuts down by 90%, that's huge. We don't need full lockdowns anymore. I was told and so is everyone else on the planet that the shutdown was to stop the, uh, the, the exponential rise of the virus. And we need to flatten the curve over a longer period of time, not lock down everything until we get a vaccine. So let people go do some things. Not everybody, but let just let some, just let some go do things. And if they spike back up again, if the number of cases spike back up, it'll be those people who get sick. Our healthcare system can handle it. And the rest of us will watch and act accordingly moving forward. I don't think that's that difficult, is it? I don't think that's hard. Like in California, uh, I live in San Diego. In California, the goal of not overwhelming the healthcare system has been achieved. Congratulations, like, praise God, we should celebrate that. But let's move forward, not based off of March 10th fears or March 10th unknowns. Let's move forward based off of, when was this article? March, April 30th. Let's move forward based off of April 30th's knowledge, or May 4th's knowledge. Let me give you an example of March 10th versus April 4th. March 10th versus April 4th. The report, the, the headline that I f we first shared, uh, children don't, pa don't pass COVID-19 to adults. Uh, by the way, on my radio show, we went over that whole study in great detail. No need to do it all here, but the very short of it, this was a survey, actually, of 78 different studies. 54 of them, maybe 55, but 54 or 55 of them were from China. <laughs> right? You're like, oh, well, like, like a bunch of them were from Wuhan. I'm like, I'm not going to believe a report from Wuhan, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and... If you read the actual report, which no one does, I mean, you have 99% of people just read the headline and make their conclusions just based off that. Maybe 1% of people actually read the article, but no one reads the actual study, which it came from. But if you did, it says many times in this, this survey that all of this is done with insufficient data in the name of speed. Some of these, kiddie, uh, these studies are done with like six kids in Wuhan, and you're like, and really, they, the, the study itself says we really don't know. But again, in the name of speed, we just had to get something out. And then Bloomberg makes this big dramatic headline, children don't pass COVID-19. By the way, they changed it. A couple hours after that, they changed the headline. But damage is already done. So anyway, the, the, I, I first saw this headline from Matt Walsh. I like Matt Walsh a lot. Uh, he's very much in the this is overblown camp, which again, I respect, I understand, I get it. I'm not in that camp, but that he is totally fine. Uh, 
So he thinks this is overblown. And he shared that headline, that Bloomberg headline. And he said, he wrote, we shut down, we shut down the schools for no reason whatsoever. That was his, we shut down schools for no reason whatsoever. If it's true that COVID doesn't spread to kids or by kids, and we'll talk about that with the professor coming up here. But if it's true that they're not carriers of the virus, if we learned that now, that's great. It's wonderful news, by the way, and we can adjust accordingly. But we did not know that on March 10th. So you can't say that we shut down schools for no reason whatsoever. That's all hindsight. It's a new virus. We had no idea anything. We still don't. But I don't think you can be critical of decisions made on March 10th. So that's an example of using May 4th knowledge to judge March 10th actions. The governor of California, Gavin Newsom, you know, he shuts down the beaches in Orange County. I think that's way overboard. I think that's using, using March 10th knowledge to mandate May 4th's actions. Does that make sense? So we're doing, people are doing both. People aren't living in the moment and making the best decisions they know at the moment. Everyone's, right, you're either like, like, like a Matt Walsh who's like, oh, what we did then was stupid. It's like, oh, well, you can't judge then based off what we know now. And then you have Gavin Newsom doing, I think, stupid things today, but he's doing that based off of things that we knew or didn't know two months ago. And you, like, you gotta live now and what we know now. And the truth is, all of this is gonna keep changing for at least a year. And everyone's got to stay as open-minded as possible. And, 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 and by open-minded, I mean undecided. And this is, this is so unnatural for us. Sorry, I touched my eye. Uh, I got it now. I'm going to get all these emails. Like, oh, people, Slater, you're a terrible example. You just touched your eye. Um, we have to stay, uh, stay undecided. It's so unnatural for us, for our brains. Our brains want certainty. Right, we need to explain everything. And to do that, our brains will, will come up with any answer. Right? The, our brains will settle down on any answer, any reason, or even better, someone to blame. They'll do it instantly. Our brains want that certainty so badly. They would rather land, our brains would rather land on any excuse, even a ridiculous one, than live in a constant state of uncertainty. And I don't like being in that state either, but it's, what we, it's where we're at. I found this quote the other day. In a few weeks, we've gone from thinking there were no asymptomatic transmissions to believing it accounts for maybe half of all cases. We've gone from uh, believing masks were unnecessary to requiring their use at all times outside the house. We've gone from panicking about ventilator shortages to deploying pregnancy massage pillows instead. I don't know what that pregnancy massage pillows are. But I remember, remember all this, like, we need more ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We've got to force Ford to make ventilators. And now it's like, oh, maybe the ventilators don't really do that much. Or some, I've heard some people say they're, they're harmful, they cause more harm than any good, or it's a very small number of cases, or we don't need any more ventilators, we've got plenty of ventilators. Like, like who knows? But I'm not going to criticize people on March 10th who are like, we need more ventilators, because who knew? I can't judge that action based off of what we know today. I'm gonna to give the least satisfying piece of advice possible to give. I will get no, no fans from this advice. If I came down hard on a stance, I would attract a certain passionate percentage of supporters to my show, right? Whatever the stance is, it doesn't matter. If I come down hard on it, then I'm gonna have that niche of people, niche, niche or niche. No one, does anyone know? I don't know. I'm gonna have that niche I hate that word, niche, I'm gonna go with niche. That group will love me forever because I'm agreeing with them. And I can find a different niche or niche all over, and I can pick, it doesn't matter. But I don't do that because I don't think anyone's right about anything. Because no one knows. And what I'm about to say is that no one's gonna shower me with praise at all. This is like the one stance you can take that no one likes. And no one's like, you're right. I love you, Slater, thank you so much, preach it. We know so little about this virus, it's gonna be a year before anyone has any idea what's going on. And in the meantime, we have to constantly be adjusting based off the best information we have on that day. How many people are in that camp? <laughs> it's such a lame position to have, and I hate it. But it's true, I think it's true. And you can't hold yourself, let alone other people, but don't even hold yourself, like be free, I'm liberating you. Be free, 
to not do it. You're like, if you hold a stance hard, you're less likely to ever adjust in the future. No need to do that now because there's nothing anyone can know for sure. It's liberating to just say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what, what, what's happening every day here. What's best? For me, I'm still staying home. I can. I can do that. I can work from home. But if you want to go to the store, you want to go to work, you want to go to a restaurant, go ahead. And the government should let everyone do that. It's time. Let's try to knock down or narrow down, pin down. So let's try to pin down some things. And we'll do that with Columbia University professor Vincent Rack and Yellow next. True story, Mike Slater. Spread the word. All right, Slider Crusaders, I've been waiting this all week. Uh, I have my notes here, and, and every time a question pops in my head, I write it down, and I get ready to ask it to Professor Vincent Racaniello, Professor of Virology at Columbia University. Professor, how are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Good to see you again. You too, sir. And, of course, uh, host of the podcast This Week in Virology, going 12 years strong. Okay, so this happened last time, so two weeks ago. You said something on the show, and I, and I thought, oh, I got way more questions. So that, it was my first question to you last week. I got to do the same thing again. So last week, you said, you heard it here first. You believe that COVID will become, I don't know if you said the common cold, but like a, like a, like a nothing virus in four to five years. So I got to ask you to go a little deeper in that. What's the science behind Because I've been repeating that to people, and they're like, why? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I forgot to ask them. So <laughs> okay. why? What will happen to the virus in the next four to five years that you think that will happen? So the, uh, the way to answer that <clears throat> is to tell you about the coronaviruses that infect us already, the ones that we've had for years and years that we don't even notice. We call them common cold coronaviruses, right? And there are four of them. Everyone gets infected with them almost every year. They don't. They barely make you sick. Nobody notices, right? And all of those viruses started out in a bat or a rodent many, many, many hundreds of years ago and then crossed over into people, very much like SARS-CoV-2. So what we think has gone here, this virus is brand new. It's spreading through the human population. Once it infects everyone or we get a vaccine and everyone's an immune, then will get reinfected, but there's not going to be any disease, very mild disease. We're going to get a common cold. And then this, the scenario will be every fall, every winter, the virus will start circulating. Kids who have never been infected will get infected, but they won't get sick because, you know, kids don't get very sick from this coronavirus. Very rare. I want to talk about that, yeah. And then they will have immunity, but not enough to prevent subsequent infections for the rest of their life but you'll never notice those infections. It'll be just a common cold, scratchy throat, sniffles gone in a day or two. And that's the cycle. And I think this virus will fall into that pattern in four or five years. Does that explain it? A little bit. Why, what about the virus? Like what happens in the virus itself that would make it less uh, harmful? Okay. So it's not the virus, it's us. We build up immunity to it. Right now, the problem is nobody as immunity. And these common cold viruses, everybody's immune, so you get infected, but you don't get very sick. This virus, nobody's immune, particularly older people. And so when they get infected, they get serious disease. But at one point, the entire population is going to be immune to this virus. And then the infections will all be mild. We won't see very many hospitalizations, if any. So we need to have a few years to get to that. And the reason I think this is going to happen is because we see it with these other coronaviruses. They originated in bats and you know, it was hundreds of years ago. So we don't have any records of what happened when those crossed over into people. But they're now irrelevant common cold viruses. And so that's why. So it's not the virus, okay? It's us that making okay. unit. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so, but in that path, of getting there. So whatever uh, whatever the hospitalization rate is and whatever the death rate is, fatality rate, like we don't even really know, right? But let's just say the hospitalization rate is 5%. So you think it'll be 5% for four to five years until we have whatever the herd immunity is and then there won't be any hospitalizations? Probably not. I mean, nobody, unless you have really serious other illnesses, nobody gets hospitalized for common colds unless you have very bad asthma, for example. So it will be very, very low, right? Okay. And you know what? I asked you last what week. Else? 
Good. The other thing is, when this happens, we won't need any of the vaccines that we're making now. Wow. <laughs> Just think wow. of that. Wow, so we're spending all this all this time, money, energy, attention, et cetera, et cetera. But well, we have do you to, think the vaccine... Have to, yeah, have to. I was going to say, do you think the vaccine's essential in the meantime? I do. I think if we can have it by next fall, fall 2021... 20, we can use it because we'll have another cycle then. Every fall, winter, we're going to have another cycle until we immunize the population. So yeah, I think we do need it. And if it comes earlier, maybe it'll come February, March. Maybe we'll be lucky. Yes, it will be valuable, but it's not going to last forever. I don't think we're going to be using it forever because we don't immunize okay. against these other common cold yeah. coronaviruses. Why are you hopeful about being able to make a vaccine at all? Well, the... Um, there are like 70 companies working on vaccines, all different kinds. I mean, every way that I teach how to make a vaccine in my virology course, and you can listen to that lecture, it's called vaccines. Every one of those approaches is being used for this. So I'm quite uh -huh. confident that one of those will work because they've all worked for other viruses. And there's nothing particularly tricky about this virus. You know, a few of these vaccines have already shown to protect animals from infection. So that's why I think they're going to work. Not all diseases, right? Obviously, you can vaccinate from. So is there something like, um, uh, which one can't? Um, malaria, right? Malaria, there's no, no vaccine. Hard right? so one, but, but in terms of viruses, HIV, right? We've been trying yep. to make vaccines for ages, and all of them fail. Every We do huge vaccine trials, hundreds of millions of dollars, and they all fail. We're missing something there. So that's a tricky one. But mm -hmm. this one is not as tricky as Okay, so I, I, we don't need to go any deeper, really. But like, so what do you think is easier about the coronavirus than maybe an HIV virus uh, on a viral standpoint? Oh, sure. I mean, the problem with HIV is when it infects you, here's the thing, it's very sneaky. It infects you, you make antibodies, and by the time you make antibodies, the virus changes. So those antibodies don't work. And so then your virus makes antibodies against the new HIV in you, and then it changes. It, that goes on forever uh -huh. and ever. And coronaviruses don't do that. They are, okay. Okay. They, they, they stay the same pretty much. Okay, you mentioned antibodies. Can you give me a little science lesson on antibodies? And because I've tried to pretend to do research. Uh, by the way, Professor, it is exhausting to pretend to be an epidemiologist on my radio and TV show every day. I don't know if you appreciate how I have to pretend to be an epidemiologist and a serologist and dabble in oil markets at the same time. It's very, very <laughs> exhausting, sir. So the other day, I had I had to pretend that I I was doing a serology segment, whatever, and uh, I had to talk about antibodies and proteins. Yeah. Can you explain proteins? I mean, I think chickens when I think protein. So explain what proteins are and their role in, in the antibody process. Well, proteins are what make a lot of us up, right? We're made of proteins and sugars and fats right? And they're the basic building blocks of us and all other animals. And, you know, when you eat chicken, like you said, you're getting protein, which you need to build your own proteins. So mm -hmm. antibodies are a kind of protein and they're kind, they're very big. And we make them when something invades us, like a virus or a bacteria. And they, these antibodies float around in our blood. They go through all our tissues, you know, our muscles, our, our respiratory tracts. And they're if they see a virus, they will clamp onto it and prevent it from infecting. So these are defensive proteins. They're really good for us to have. So if you can make a test to detect proteins, uh, antibodies against the virus, you know that that person has been infected with it because if you haven't been infected or encountered the virus in some way, you're not going to have any antibodies against it. You only make them when something comes into you. Okay. So uh, you could take my blood today and look for antibodies against the coronavirus and tell if I'd ever been infected in my past life. Yeah. So these are valuable proteins for us, not just because they protect us against infection, but we can use them to detect who's been infected. That's amazing, right? Like, are you constantly amazed by the human body? And Oh, it's all amazing. It life is, like, is bloody amazing and people are amazing. I wish we would treat each other better because we are really amazing things that have evolved here and animals and everything, you know, it's all amazing. And the, the deeper you go, the more you're amazed and you want to learn more and more. Yes. And it's a spiral. It's like Alice in Wonderland, you know, you keep going down the hole. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of people being amazing, our next segment or at the end of the show, we're going to talk about Maurice Hilleman, which is a name oh. that obviously you know. 
But no one Weird. knows. Like, how did I go my whole life, Professor, without knowing the guy who's probably saved more lives than anyone in history? Yeah, well, if you had talked to me, I would have told you. Maybe you need to talk to me more because he's he's amazing. I do. He I made, want to. <laughs> he made like uh, a dozen vaccines that we're all using today. He used to work at Merck, of yeah. course. And yeah, he's he is Doctor Vaccine for sure. Great. I've never heard of him my whole life, and everyone needs to know him. So we're gonna do that coming up here. Um, okay, what percentage of people do you think will get this virus eventually? I guess maybe eventually it would be like over the next four to five years. I guess. Oh, I think 45 years, uh, if if we don't vaccinate, then probably 90% plus of the population will be infected. Really? Okay. Five years, yeah. But you- at, at um, I would say between 50 and 70% infection, then probably the circulation of the virus is really hard, and it gets really hard for it to circulate and infect the rest. Okay, 50 to 70. And when do you think we'll hit about 50 to 70? Obviously, there's a ton of variables there, but at this current but, pace. You know, it depends where you live, because in New York... We seem to be at 20 percent already and so uh, it depends on how the virus circulates it seems to be going down as you know the curves are all sinking right so there's less mm-hmm. and less circulation so i'm not sure we're going to reach 50 percent this summer maybe uh november december when it comes back and starts circulating but that's new york you know there are many parts of the u.s and other parts of the world where there's very little person-to-person contact you know in new york you walk around you encounter hundreds of people on a daily basis, right? And they can all be sharing mm. viruses with you. But in other countries, in other parts of the U.S., much less. So you're going to reach 50 percent a lot, a lot longer. It's going to take for sure. Which, which just drag this whole thing out, right? If you're in Nebraska or wherever, this is just going to drag out even longer than it would in New York, no? Yes, and so you could, uh, you could make the argument that Nebraska is at risk because if anyone went from New York to Nebraska, they could infect them. But nobody does that, right? Nobody knows why it goes to Nebraska. Not, not from New York, right? Yeah. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> um, okay. Hope you don't have why, so I read it. No, no. <laughs> That's our number one uh, rating center. Um, what? I want to talk about kids in schools. Let's do that next. Um, mm. let, there was one more question I was going to ask you about. Oh, oh do you have your best estimate on the r not of this virus? Oh, I think it's between two and three. So every infected okay. person on average infects two to three other people. And that's a lot. Did so we have to get it below one if we're going to stop the outbreak. And the way you do that is by making antibodies, which can happen from infection or from a vaccine. Do you have any advice, practical advice? And I never want to get political with you, sir, because I, I don't, that's not necessary, but like any practical advice, like, masks, we should decrease our contacts by 80%, things like that, that you're like, oh, we definitely need to be doing. Oh, masks are the key, I think, because they will make it safe for you to stand pretty close to someone. As long as you have a mask, you're not going to be inhaling their droplets and vice versa. So I think as we're going back and thinking about going back, you have to wear masks and companies need to make their employees wear masks. Unless you're alone as you are in a room, then you don't have to wear one. But yeah. uh, you mask is key, and also checking and testing extensively has to happen as we go back to work, because we learned actually from South Korea that if you test early and contact trace, if someone's infected, you you mm. determine all the people that have been in contact with them and quarantine them. That's a great way to stop the spread of this virus. They did it, and nobody else, uh, maybe aside from China, was able to do that. Okay, we'll talk more with uh, Professor Vincent Racaniello from Columbia University, Professor of Virology. His podcast is This Week in Virology. And I heard your, I think it was, I don't know if it was last episode or two episodes ago, and you used this word, interferion antagonists. Is that, yeah. did, I, did I get that right? Is that a word? Okay, maybe we can talk about that next, because that's a great word that I can use on friends uh, okay. during my peer-reviewed text messages. Uh, and they can be really, really impressed with me. So we'll talk about that next. Professor Rack and Yellow, more coming up. True story, Mike Slater. Spread the word. All right, Slater Crusaders, I want to get back to my favorite guest, Professor Vincent Racaniello, Professor of Virology at Columbia University. His entire course is online for free, or at least, Professor, do you teach uh, one course, or how many courses do you teach? I teach one course a year, and every year I put it on YouTube for free. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, that's up there. And then, of course, This Week in Virology is his podcast, 12 Years Strong. Okay, let's talk about kids, sir. Um, kicked off the show with two Bloomberg headlines about kids. One was, uh, don't worry about it. Kids don't spread the virus. And two and a half hours later, Bloomberg posted a headline, you know, kids spread the virus and we shouldn't go back to school. So what in the world? Talk to us about kids and COVID. What do we know? What do we need to learn? So kids are unique because they get infected with the virus. It multiplies in them. And most kids do not get sick. And deaths are very, very rare. And people always say, oh, I know kids got sick. Yeah, now and then there's always going to be one when you're infecting millions and millions of people. But kids don't get sick. However, they do spread the virus. So, you know, in the classroom, you have a classroom full of kids. They're spreading it to the teacher who could be older. And that's, that's at risk for them because they could get sick. And you could bring it home to your older parents or grandparents or caregivers or whatever. That's the issue. We're not actually too worried about the kids per se. We're worried about the people they may contact and spread infections. So, yes, they do spread virus. Okay? So, no it seems, so it seems like from an epidemiological perspective, if you're just looking at that, opening up schools would be the worst thing to do. Uh, opening schools is going to be very challenging. It's it's almost wow. like open, opening a theater. You know, the theater, I spoke last week to theater owners. They're freaking out because, you know, you're sitting right next to each other in the seats. And schools are a similar situation. What are we going to do? So I think school is finished until the fall. But we have to figure out how to get kids back to school in the fall. All right, there are ways we can do it. I don't think we should have schooling at home all the time. It doesn't work for everyone. But there's some ways, if you'd like, we can talk about it. But it's a challenge because there's so many kids packed together in these tiny classrooms. You know, one option sure. would be to cut the classroom size by 25%. Who can do that? We don't have enough rooms to do that, right? So it's, it's yeah. a challenge for sure. Yeah. I mean, so we, our kids aren't in school age yet, but we don't get sick a lot in our house. But everyone of school age kids are like, oh, wait till they go to kindergarten. Like, you'll, yeah. just, you'll, get, you'll be sick every weekend. So it's not good that this that covid will spread via kids as well uh but obviously there's other factors to keep in mind okay so why does a virus react differently between a kid and an adult and for you the one study i read was uh, they defined kids as 10 or under 10 is that how kid is defined in the virology world or how's that work i have 20 year old kids i still call them kids <laughs> but in, yeah th in terms of sars cov2 we're talking about less than 10 years old because they've never seen the virus. It's their first infection. And they get a nice, vigorous infection. They make a lot of virus, but they don't even know it most of the time. They don't get sick. And you want to know why they're different from older people. And that's a great question. I don't have an answer, but I can say what we think is going on. So older people, over 70, those are the most serious cases. You know, as you age, your immune system fails, okay? Uh, for example, your bone marrow has a lot of the cells that become cells that make antibodies. And as you age, your bone marrow goes away. You know, your bones, your long bones become hollow. You can't really make new antibodies. It's very hard. So that's part of the reason why older people uh, get more serious infections. Kids are great. They're brand new. In the first 10 years, they've just been minted. They have great immune systems for the most part. They can make a nice response and limit infections, which is not always beneficial because sometimes immunity can cause disease. But in this virus, it seems to be okay. I think that was going to lead to my follow-up, which is the cytokine, if I pronounce that right, a cytokine yes. storm. And it seems, it seems to be causing a lot of trouble. Can you explain that process and then why that doesn't happen for kids? So when you uh, get infected with the virus, one of the things you do is make these antibodies that we talked about, these big proteins that can clamp onto the virus and prevent them from infecting. But you also make a lot of other defenses. You have to. You can't just do one thing. Uh, so you make another defense called cytokines, which are also proteins. They're a bit smaller than antibodies. And they float around in your bloodstream, go to different tissues, uh, and they can have effects. They can limit infection themselves. They can bring in uh, cells, immune cells, that can help clear the infection. So this all has to be, this is like a, a military operation. This has to be coordinated. If it's not, things are going to go wrong. So in some people, they are not able to coordinate all of this, and it goes overboard. We call it over-exuberant immune response. And in fact, in these people who get sick and can't breathe and have to be intubated, that's what's happening to them. They've had the initial infection in their upper tract, 
and it's starting to go down, but then the body is making an overboard immune response, cytokines and antibodies. And that is actually what damages their lungs and causes blood clots and all of these other side effects that you've been hearing about is the immune response. And that is, so we don't really know why some people do that. We, we think it's genetic, but people are still working on trying to understand that. So that's why uh, in this case, people get very sick. Why don't kids have a cytokine storm? Uh, that's a great question. It's probably because uh, at that age, their immune system is finely tuned already to be able to suppress wow. it. Or you might even argue it's not yet developed enough at that age. To be oh, able to do wow. It's either one. It would be either one or maybe both. So, yeah, so kids, we Whoa. say, are free of these cytokine storms because they're, they're, they're still immature. Their systems are immature. It takes a number of years more for them to fully develop, whereas a 60 or 70-year-old, you know, it is developed and, and shows these defects, yeah. What, do you, what have you heard about blood type and the difference there if you get it? So I've, yeah, many people have mentioned this to us on our podcast and asked us about it. And, you know, these are things you're, you're seeing uh, in news reports mainly. So I don't have the data and I can't look at it. I would like to have some sure. real science data and take a look at it. And that's how I make my conclusions. I haven't seen that yet. Sure. But, you know, you have to be careful when you see this is associated with this because it could be something else that you're not looking at that's actually causing the, the serious disease or less serious disease. Yes. yes. Uh, it's, it's hard to isolate just that one cause. Uh, read one article about a, a guy in somewhere, South Korea, I don't know, who had it in his body for 40 days, which seems to be longer than most people have it. Um, what do we know about how long this thing can last in your body? So when you say thing, that's an important word, right? What are we talking yeah, about? Right. Are we talking about are we talking about infectious virus, which means a virus that could go and infect another cell, or pieces of it, broken parts of it that persist mm. for a long time? And so, in most in mild infections, this virus, infectious virus, lasts about two weeks, and then after that, it dwindles to really low levels, which makes it very unlikely that you're going to transmit it. However, if you did a PCR test, so PCR is this diagnostic test that we can run to see if you're infected right now, right? You do that, you can detect viral genomes, the nucleic acid for weeks and weeks and weeks, but mm. it's not infectious virus. It's just pieces of it that are broken up and they linger for some reason a long time. And the sicker mm. people, it lingers even longer. So this individual, I'm not surprised, 40 days, but that's not infectious. That person cannot transmit that virus uh, for 40 days. It, it stopped doing that much longer. Okay. Uh, what is your understanding or your belief about uh, droplets and aerosols in the air and spreadability, viral load of like walking past someone or any other interactions that we may or may not have with people moving forward as we decide what to do? Uh, where, what's, what's an interaction that you think is, is, has too high of a risk maybe for transmission and some things that are, will be fine? Well, most of the transmission that we've seen, and this has been studied in, in countries where there have been a lot of cases, most of it happens in homes or in closed environments, businesses, where a lot of people are in a room and they're all breathing and you're within a few feet and you're inhaling their droplets. Because when you breathe and when you talk and cough, you're putting out these droplets and other person could breathe them in. So that's the risk when you're in with a lot of people. You know, one person walking by you is a low risk because you don't know if they're infected at all. And if they are, it's probably too fast to do anything. And that's why we wear right. masks anyway, to prevent that. So the most risk is what we want to do now is go back to work, right? You want to go to a restaurant, you're in there with 100 people within a few feet of you. That's a big risk if a few of them are infected, mm -hmm. right? So that's what we have to be careful about. Would you go on an airplane? I would go and wear a face mask, sure. I would go to Wuhan, okay. actually. I would love to go and interview the scientists there. It would be <laughs> cool. <laughs> You'd go to Wuhan? I feel like you might be the only one on that flight, Professor. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, they have some delicious bat soup. Um, get it. It's a deal, I'm sure. Uh, okay, let me throw it to you, sir. We've got a few minutes left. Any, anything that you've found really interesting? I know you've done a couple interviews with... Uh, a, a, a doctor, Daniel Griffin, and then with another professor uh, or researcher who's studying this specifically. What are some big things you've learned uh, in your most recent conversations that you think we need to know? 
Well, I think the, some of the things we touched on at the top, this idea of the common cold coronaviruses, I interviewed an epidemiologist this past week also, uh, and he mentioned he's done a study of infections in New York City. He had a cohort of 100 so people and he, he sampled them periodically. And he found they kept getting reinfected with these common cold coronaviruses, but they didn't even remember being sick. And so that's why I think this virus will uh, eventually be something like that. The other thing I learned is really, this is very important for your listeners. So everyone's heard of remdesivir, right? Which is being touted as maybe a solution. Well, one study came out of China where they found it was of no value. And what they do is they treat people who are very sick with this. And the reason is because this is an intravenously given drug. You can't take this as a pill. It's not available. Oh. So IV only. And I never knew, you know, you can't go to a drugstore and fill a prescription for an IV drug. So this is not a drug for everyone. It's a drug for when you're in a hospital, which means you're already very sick and you're probably past the peak of virus reproduction. So by definition, this drug is not going to be all that useful. I mean, it may save lives, which is good, but it's not going to prevent the the most of us from getting infected. So we're going to need something else. I think people should realize that with remdesivir, it's not the solution, but there may be some other drugs that are being tested that can help us. Could could remdesivir, whatever, if you took it earlier, do you think there could be some, like if you could take a pill, would you think it might be helpful or is that just not even a Oh yes. Option? In fact, there's a related drug uh, which is being tested which is a pill form. They were able to make it in a pill right. form. So that means when you take it, it gets into your blood from your stomach. And so that would right. be great. Because there you could get diagnosed. Oh, you infected, start taking this and you would stop it in its tracks, which is good not only for you, but you're also not spreading it to other people. And if we can you know, knock down the viruses that way, we knock down transmission and we can end the epidemic. But we don't have it. So yet. you're hopeful, you're hope, but are you hopeful about a treatment coming? Yes, I am. Absolutely. There's, some, okay. there's so many people working on this. Something will come out and we will have something. It's just, you know, are we going to have it for the fall or not? I'm not sure yet. That would be great. Mm. Okay. Last question for you, sir. Um, I want to talk about experts. I want to talk to you about experts. What do... I, we can... I read... I've done this so many different topics where I read one thing and then literally the next article I read is the exact opposite. And each have... The do doctors say, study says this. <laughs> what is a pretend epidemiologist, an armchair novice of all this stuff like me and like our listeners supposed to do with this? Like, how do we interpret experts say, this study says, what do we do with all that? Yeah, I know it's a problem because everybody has their own opinion. But what I like to say is in medicine and science, uh, you can have your own opinion, but you can't have your own facts. So you have to go to the facts, which are usually in the science journals, and most people uh, don't want to do that. And so what are you going to do? So you depend on what you hear in the news and the newspapers from you know, experts. But as I said, everyone has their own opinion. So I, that's why we do a science podcast. We have a bunch of scientists sitting down and we talk. And when someone says something that's not quite right? The other people jump on them and say, hey, what are you talking about? That's not right. Yeah. And so between us, be having this conversation, we get to the truth if there is a truth and so that's yep. why that's what i think is the way to go but i know most people can't listen to it a long podcast uh, but i think seeking out on your own that sort of material stay away from the new big news programs because they're going to yep. have the flashy stuff that gets you know eyeballs and go to, go to the lower profile go to sites there are plenty of scientists no. doing their own communicating you know and i'll tell you they can't spend or they won't i don't know why they won't spend 30 minutes with you uh, trying to get some answers here. Everything's got to be three minutes, three minute segments, and that's super no, frustrating. I was, on, I, I was on CNN, and they gave me a couple of minutes to answer questions, right? It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, like, what's the point of that? Well, there's no point. I lied. Last question, but we do have to go, and I know you got to go too. Um, the doctors, the urgent care doctors in Bakersfield, California, who a lot of people are grabbing onto what they said, and they concluded that this has a 0.03% fatality rate. Uh, did you see those guys? And, and what do you think of, of their conclusions? No, I don't think you can say what the fatality rate is at this point. Is it, it might be low, but we don't know yet. The data are certainly not there to conclude that. And all you have to do is look at yesterday. We had 300 plus deaths in New York, right? It's, it's yeah. not 0.03. I mean, if it turns out that millions and millions of people are infected, it could be lower. 
but that doesn't mean anything to say that because people are dying and that's what we have to avoid. Yeah, it's too soon. All right, Professor Racaniello, This Week in Virology. Go watch that podcast, everybody. Uh, and then if you watch his course. It's unbelievable that we live in an era. Professor, people spend thousands and thousands of dollars to take your course, and it's free on YouTube. Like, what? how is that possible? Uh, well, you got to so thank Columbia for that. They're, they're letting it happen, too, right? Yeah, that's amazing. So go watch that, and um, and then hopefully, Professor, you can join us next Monday and answer my questions, my dumb I will. questions. That I will. Happy to. Figuring out. Prof uh, wonderful. Professor, thanks so much, sir. Have a superb day. You too. All right, we'll come back. We'll talk with um, Maurice Hilleman. Next. True story. Mike Slater. Spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders. I want to talk about a man that I've, I've never heard of him until... Friday. Now, Professor Racaniello's heard of him, of course. Uh, I never have. Have you? Maurice Hilleman? They're like, oh, yeah, Maurice. Of course I know Maurice. <laughs> never heard of him. I think he's someone we, should, we all should know. I would love to see God's list of people we should know and we should study and learn from and, and compare ourselves to, et cetera. Like God's list and then our culture's list. <laughs> all right. So his, uh, God's top 20 and our top 20, people we know, people we should know versus people we know. I bet there's no overlap. <laughs> I bet there's no overlap, right? God's like, hey, here's the 20 people you should know and our 20 people we most know. And we'd be comparing notes, be like, hey, God, do you got, uh, you got Joe Exotic on your list? On your top? Is he, really? No, no Carol Baskin? You don't have any Carol Baskin? Not on your time. Okay. Well, everyone knows Carol Baskin. Dylan Passage, even? Do we have Dylan? Do we have Joe's boyfriend or husband? No, not. Wow. All right. Dylan Passage. No Dylan Passage. All right. Our lists don't compare at all. Maurice Hilleman, I feel like, would be on that list of God's people we should know, or God's list of people we should know. But we don't. He saved millions of lives. Millions and millions and millions of lives. Here's a short of his story. He grew up in Montana in the middle of the, the Spanish flu, actually. He survived uh, diphtheria which we'll get to in a second. He was uh, raised by his aunt and uncle during the Great Depression, true poverty. His life goal was to graduate high school and work at the J.C. Penney in town. But his brother said, no, man, you got to go to college. So he did. Uh, I think Montana State. And then he went on to earn a Ph.D. in microbiology and chemistry at the University of Chicago. I'll cut to the chase. He developed 40 vaccines, 40, to prevent measles, mumps, rubella, pneumonia, meningitis, Hep A and Hep B, among others. His measles vaccine alone saves a million lives a year. Every year! He saves a million lives, this guy. I, I, like, you gotta argue, he saved more lives than any other scientist and therefore any other person in the 20th century. That, that's gotta be true. I don't know how many people like polio killed every year, but this guy, this guy was many, many, many different diseases. Who would have saved more lives than Maurice Hilleman? I've never heard of him! So the reason I heard about him the other day is 1957. He was the chief of respiratory disease at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And he was in his office and he was reading the New York Times and he read an article about uh, a flu in Hong Kong that infected 10% of the population, 250,000 people at the time. And Hilleman read the article and he put the paper down and he said, my God, this is the pandemic. It's here, 1957. So he called the army lab in Japan and a medical officer there found some Navy sailor who had the flu, had him gargle salt water, spit into a cup, and they mailed it back to America. So he got the sample a couple weeks later, and then he and his team, they started working 14-hour days to try and isolate the virus strain. Again, 1947 technology, 1957 technology. He spent the rest of his time trying to convince everyone else that this was going to become a pandemic, right? Because no one believed him. But they finally were able to isolate the strain. They sent the strain to six different American companies to produce vaccines. Now, at this point, we've been making vaccines for about 10 years, flu vaccines for, for about 10 years. So this wasn't a completely new process, but um, he knew that if this was going to make a difference, then it would have to be done in, and, and distributed in four months. So he had to make and distribute a vaccine and pr make, produce, and distribute in four months. And that's never been done before. He said, I know how the system, I, I knew how the system worked. He said he bypassed everything and called the manufacturers himself. He's, he's like, 
screw the process. I'm calling the manufacturers. We got to go. That's what he did. And it worked. Vaccine started in July, and the, the flu hit America in, in, in September, just as he predicted. 40 million doses in just the next three months. 40 million. You know, the president has uh, this Manhattan Project-like mission going down uh, to get a vaccine by, by January. It's called Operation Warp Speed. I'm so jaded with the news and just like whatever's good, like our country today, that I read that a couple times and I was like, oh yeah, Operation Warp Speed, that makes sense. It took a buddy of mine to text me and say, can you believe the president called it Operation Warp Speed? How awesome is that? Maurice Hilleman was, was a one man Operation Warp Speed. Would have been 100 years old last year. Died from cancer in 2005. Uh, he volunteered his, his own lungs for uh, experimental cancer research at the end of his life. An amazing man. So why don't we know him? I've never heard his name before. There's a couple of these guys like Louis Pasteur you've heard, Jonas Salk, uh, like Edward Jenner. Like, 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 that's it. Like, those are like the scientists that we know. Uh, in this world, um, this vaccine world. So why, did, why don't we know this guy? Why don't we know Maurice Hilleman? First of all, he didn't name any vaccines after himself. And I think the big one is he didn't work in academia. He worked in the industry. So uh, no one in academia land gave him a lot of credit. They didn't give any awards. Right? And a lot of credit and a lot of no, uh, notoriety. So this guy invented, discovered, created nine of the 14 vaccines that kids get today. Nine of the 14 vaccines that you got when you were a kid. One person did all that. He said there's great joy in being useful. And that's the satisfaction you get out of it. And he said, other than that, it's the quest of science and winning the battle over these damn bugs. So other than that being just an awesome American story, farm boy from Montana and the depression goes on to save millions of lives for the future of life on earth. Like that's, <laughs> that's amazing. And to think that he could have worked at JCPenney. But think of this now, too. There is someone out there. There's a lot of people working on it now. But there's, someone's going to get it, as the professor is always hopeful. Every time we talk to the professor, he always says, he's always very hopeful that someone's going to do this. Someone's going to come up with this vaccine or treatment and save millions of lives around the world. And they're going to get our economy back and, and get everything back to normal. Who's that person going to be? Who are they? What's their life story? Can't wait to hear it. Of course, this assumes that this isn't some giant pandemic from Bill Gates to all of service with microchips. Obviously, if that's not true, then someone's out there trying to find the cure. And I can't wait. In the meantime, let's try and remember that name. Maurice Hilleman. True story. Mike Slater. See you tomorrow. Spread the word.